people to log in. Uh, my name is Michael Sperling, and this is a program, again, sponsored by the American Epilepsy Society. Uh, Jill Hunt, who works for the, directly for the Society, is on with me. Uh, this is an interactive session. We'll do some case studies, and, I, and as I like to do, I'm going to mix it up just with a couple of other things. I'll show you a video or an image along the way, too, intermittently, just, just to mix it up. Uh, and, and we'll move along that way. I'd like it to be interactive. Please speak and participate, otherwise it's not terribly interesting. And I'll have a bunch of polls also, uh, questions that we'll have along the way. So we'll start with case one. Case one is a seven-year-old girl, uh, so we do have a kid here too, who's noted by her teachers to stare off into space many times a day in class, probably for a week or two, her teacher thinks. Uh, she calls the, the mother, at home or the father at home to, to say this, that she's noted this, and she says the child looks like she stares off for five or, five or 10 seconds. If she calls to the kid, uh, the kid will respond sometimes right away, but often she'll call her and then she'll say something a second time and then the child responds. And, and it's happening many times a day, she can't count it, but, and, and the child thinks everything's normal. And the parents haven't noticed anything either, of course. The parents think that the kid's fine and says that she never pays attention. I mean, this is nothing new. Uh, she has a normal developmental history. Her medical history is completely unremarkable. Family history is positive for a maternal aunt who had a single tonic-clonic seizure at the age of 14 and nothing after that. And uh, we don't know any other history other than the, the uh, uh, mother says that there, you know, her sister you know, saw a doctor, had some tests, everything was normal and nothing happened. Her examination is completely normal at baseline. In the office, I hyperventilated her, and she paused briefly for about four or five seconds with a little bit of eye flutter. So my first question to you, which I think we have in a poll, yeah, here it is, is what do you think the EEG will show in this case? And I've given you a few choices. Four hertz generalized spike wave, three hertz generalized spike wave, two hertz generalized spike wave, left anterior temporal spikes, or normal. And you don't have a lot of time to offer your opinion. Let's do it fast. I don't want to spend too much time having people answer. So there's a certain consistency of response thus far. We'll give two more seconds for you to vote. Two, one, stop. We'll end the poll. I will share the result. And every single person who responded, which is only 16 of you, said three hertz generalized spike wave. Okay. This is her EEG. This is what it shows. Does somebody want to tell me what it shows, actually? Somebody, some, somebody unmute yourself, or a couple people unmute yourselves, and tell me what you see in this EEG. So we see three hertz uh, generalized spike and slow wave. It's uh, more anterior frontal predominant and more um, predominant at F4 and F3. Um, okay. Kind of, we don't see it much in the occipital uh, region, but uh, I would still think that this is still in the keeping of IG. Okay, so let me, let's look at the first <laughs> second where the burst appears. Actually, we can notice a little bit of theta appearing rhythmically in the front right at the start, unless that's eye movement. It's hard to be sure. Perhaps it's eye movement. But then when you see the bursts, are these at three hertz? Actually, we can see polyspikes to the discharge more. There's a little hint of a polyspike up here, right? And you see yeah. here prefrontally. And if you notice at the start, it's, it's just about at 5 hertz. Towards the end, it does seem to slow down. So I think we can, one, two, three, we can find a segment in here where it's 3 hertz. But in fact, so my, my poll question was a little deceptive because there really isn't a correct answer. It's, there, it's not one frequency, and this is pretty typical for generalized spike waves seen in idiopathic generalized epilepsy, if that's what you think this kid has. But that it starts out a little faster. Often it starts out around four hertz. This, this girl is starting at even five hertz or so, and there's a little poly, whoops, actually, little polyphasic component here. It looks like it's interrupted briefly, and then it resumes. And it resumes then at one, two, three, three and a half hertz, and then it slows down, and then it stops. And this is a, a burst that lasts one, two, three, four, five seconds. 
long enough that if that the child might stare and be symptomatic. So typically, three hertz, what we call three hertz spike and wave, often will start around four hertz, sometimes even a little faster, as you see here, and then slow down to about two and a half hertz and then stop. And it's not uncommon to see this rhythmic little theta buildup that then develops into a generalized spike wave for half a second or so at the start. And often when it ends, it'll end with some delta waves also. Uh, uh, and, and you can see the spikes kind of go in the delta. And again, this, the delta wave represents inhibition, primarily generated thalamically, although obviously we're, we're recording EEG, we're recording from cortex, so there's cortical inhibition as well. Uh, but it, it's not actually quite so crisp. So had you said four hertz or three hertz, it would have been fine. Two hertz, that's too slow. Uh, and it's obviously not focal from the history. So question number two, and we'll uh, just put up another question. So what is your diagnosis? And you've got some choices here. Mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, juvenile absence, childhood absence, or Jeevan syndrome. So offer your opinions. So not as many people have voted on this as for the EEG yet, but let's keep going. Well, 13, okay. Two seconds more and then we'll stop. Okay, I will end the polling and share the results. So one person said juvenile absence and 14 said childhood absence epilepsy. So this is a seven-year-old girl, I said, who developed this. And she, I am saying she's having many per day. Uh, with a little eye flutter. So they're clearly absence seizures. And typically juvenile absence epilepsy is going to start in adolescence. And I think the youngest age by definition that's been applied, although obviously it, it's an arbitrary definition, but it seems to apply when you look at who happens. And it doesn't happen under age 10 or so. Typically it would start at age 10 or later. And this is the perfect age or you know, even a year later, often it starts at five or six for childhood absence epilepsy. Uh, also, if you think about seizure frequency, how often do people with childhood absence epilepsies have seizures? Somebody want to say? Candace, can I pick on you, harass you? So how often, how often do people with childhood absence epilepsy have seizures? For absence seizures, it's very frequent, maybe up to 100 per day. Yeah, hundreds, maybe 200, maybe 300, they have hundreds. And what about juvenile absence epilepsy? How often do they have absences? I think less frequent than childhood absence. Yeah, so the, the, the juvenile absence are the ones who might have a few in a day or a few in a week. So that's again, a, a clinically different syndrome. And we can distinguish between them as well because the childhood absence epilepsy, you know, a, a minority of them have tonic-clonic seizures and they develop it a bit later usually if they do, whereas with juvenile absence epilepsy, uh, a majority of them, not all, but a majority will have tonic-clonic seizures at some point, although it may not start with tonic-clonic seizures. Uh, and if it does, then in retrospect, people may recognize that the uh, child or adolescent was uh, staring off a little bit. What percentage of people with juvenile absence epilepsy have myoclonus, by the way? You wanna stay with me? So what percentage of people with, with juvenile absence have myoclonus? Anybody know? They still kind of have it, but uh, less frequent than juvenile myoclonic absence. Yeah, it's actually, yeah, so, so juvenile absence epilepsy, in some series, a majority of those kids also have some myoclonus, but the difference between JME, juvenile myoclonic, and juvenile absence is that in juvenile myoclonic, the myoclonus is far more prominent, the absences are minor, Whereas in juvenile absence, the absences that are predominant seizure type in the myoclonus is more minor. Now, obviously, you know, the definition is to a certain extent in the eye of the beholder. And if I take a much more detailed history and really focus on the myoclonus uh, about that, maybe I'll suspect juvenile absence more so than JME. So there, there's obviously a little bit of overlap there where, you know, one group has more myoclonus, one has more absence, but they can both have the same and they both have tonic-clonic seizures perhaps. So it becomes a little bit tricky. And then Jeevan syndrome, which I have down below, is a, is a specific syndrome with, with very prominent eye flutter and, and this child doesn't fit it. Now let's, uh, uh, whoops. Now what I wanna do is ask the next question, which is 
what are you going to recommend to treat this child, this seven-year-old who's doing this? And I have a few choices up here. Lamotrigine, levetiracetam, ethosuximide, valproate, and clobazam. So please offer your opinions. How are you going to treat her? Okay, three seconds to go. Two, one, we will stop. Okay. I'll end the polling and share the results. So you can see of 17 people who voted, 15 said ethosuximide, one said levetiracetam, and one said lamotrigine. Okay. I voted for uh, valvroid, but it didn't come up. I don't didn't know come why. up. Maybe your vote, I don't know, your vote might have been just right after I clicked it, I apologize. So <laughs> okay. in any case, this is one of those cases where there's obviously room for individual judgment and people may have side effects to one drug or another, but particularly after, uh, you know, the you know, Lamotrigine came out, uh, it, be it started to become quite popular with people to a point where people were recommending it as the drug of choice uh, in the early 2000s. Ethosuximide had been before that, ethosuximide being uh, an agent that really was thought to be quite effective, but had a bit in the way of side effects. And then Tracy Glauser published two papers. The first one went into the New England Journal of Medicine, which was the results for 16 weeks of treatment, and then epilepsy got the one year paper that followed up that the New England Journal didn't want it. And it really showed, this was 446 subjects randomized to either valproate, lamotrigine, or ethosuximide. Those are the drugs. Levetiracetam was not tested. And we lack good data for levetiracetam in this, you know, really randomized trial data for that. And this looks at treatment failure, which could be defined as either intolerable side effects or failure of seizure control. So it's sort of, uh, you know, overall, it, it, it makes no sense to say that 100% of people respond, but also 97% died. Uh, you wouldn't use the drug as your best choice. You have to look at, you know, intolerable side effects or, or adverse effects as well. So this combines the two, and I have the data on the side. But you can see if you go out through the first 15 weeks or so, there's not much in the way of difference. Lamotrigine is, you know, is, uh, you know, you know, up at the top and ethosuximide at the bottom, though it's not really a significant difference. But then as you follow it along, you can see at 16 weeks, that in that last, whoops, I accidentally clicked my mouse, in that last week, uh, or week and a half, it was before 16, and this was their arbitrary defined time point, there was a difference. So they actually did report a statistically significant difference because at 16 weeks, the motion gene had dropped down here. But if you see, if you take it out, to 25, 30, out to a year, there's rather a substantial difference in treatment failure between the two. And ethosuximide and valproate were basically the same. There was no difference between the two. And lamotrigine, you can see, only about a quarter, a little under a quarter of people uh, respond, you know, were, were considered uh, to be treatment successes. Three quarters were treatment failures, which is a substantial difference. As you see, reports of drug trials. You will notice that it is common for drug trials to report the results of a 12 weeks randomized trial from placebo to control, or one dose to another. And this is an example, had they chosen a 12 week time course, they would have not found a difference. So the devil is in the details, and I think we have to be very careful. And this is why some drugs are, you know, do well in trials and then in, in, in the real world, we just don't like them, we don't use them because in the real world, we don't treat people for 12 weeks, we go longer. So, you know, gabapentin in the trials is clearly efficacious. Uh, most people do not like it especially and think that it's not the most potent drug uh, by a long shot. And in fact, one drug that was approved, Tiagabine, uh, under the brand name Gabitril, uh, nobody uses anymore. You'll, 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 you'll find very few prescriptions because people's common experience was that you, when you put people on this drug, nobody did well over time. So, you know, it was fine for the first 12 weeks, but, you know, in clinical practice, you know, people coming back just didn't report, report benefit. And, you know, after you've treated a number of patients, you, you decide to give up. Now, if you look at failure of seizure control at, six, at 12 months here on the left, uh, you know, Lamotrigine failed in 55% of the time, ethosuximide and valproate about 15% of the time. So that's a substantial difference. So, you know, why would you use a drug that 
has a little more than 50% chance of failure, intolerable side effects that cause a, re cause a reason for someone to stop. You can see what's worst with Valpro, 33%. Lamotrigine is better tolerated, a little better tolerated than methosuximide. Um, and you can see the odds ratio of treatment failure were about three, depending upon where you are. Uh, uh, one was 2.85, one drug of uh, that drug to uh, Lamotrigine, and the other was 3.1 uh, or so. Uh, so that's a difference. And then if you look, this is a study published a little more recently by uh, Ruth Shinar, Shlomo Shinar and Einstein's uh, colleague and spouse, um, looking at some measures of a child behavioral checklist. And I, I put arrows on this table from the paper, which was published in Neurology in 2017, the reference down there. You can see sort of total problems for ethosuximide, really sort of, and I don't fully understand this table because this is total problems, one, and then individual ones are higher. I don't under, it, it could be better explained in, in the paper what they did, but you see one student here, three kids here, and 11 here out of about 100. And again, you look at attention problems, two for ethosuximide, nine for lamotrigine, which is high, and 14 for valproate. You go to attention deficit hyperactivity, two for ethosuximide, four for lamotrigine, nine for valproate. And you know the p-values are over here that are significant. And again, if you go out to 12 months, again, still significant, statistically significant uh, for attention problems, one one kid on ethosuximide, one on lamotrigine, and nine on valproate. Now this is a behavioral checklist. This is uh, a survey that's filled out. Uh, and you often wonder, do parents uh, become accustomed to these things and, and perhaps not pay quite so much attention? Uh, but again, further evidence that valproate really does have more in the way of adverse effects on, on brain function in, in kids. And you know, it would be an argument for perhaps using ethosuximide before valproate, independent of any other potential side effect in, in, in a child. Uh, and since the kid's job at age six or seven is basically to learn, to go to school and to learn, and to learn academically and to learn, you know, to be a, 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 a good human, a good person and everything else, and you know, whatever helps improve learning uh, and attention certainly makes a difference would be ideal. So that would just be a comment going back to this previous slide that valproate and ethosuximide are the same. The, you know, the combination of efficacy and tolerable side effects, there wasn't a statistically significant difference, but uh, with valproate in any case, there, there is a little bit more in the way of problem long term. Any questions or comments here before we go to the next case? Yes, please. Uh, having a, a convulsive uh, seizure in her family history, uh, it refers to us that it is genetic generalized epilepsy on one hand, but uh, being osuximide limited to a single seizure type, uh, you are not afraid that uh, this kid would develop a convulsive motor seizure, putting in mind their family history and the possibility of combination seizure types uh, with a childhood absence epilepsy? Yeah, so great point. Are you worried about that? So there are three ways of thinking, of three, three factors that affect it. Number one, the phenotypic expression of idiopathic generalized epilepsy is different within fam be between different family members within a single family. So one person can have tonic-clonic seizures, another relative, the sibling, might only have myoclonus and nothing more, or might have absence and nothing more. Or, or con so the fact that an aunt had a tonic-clonic seizure doesn't necessarily mean that this child will have it. You, you see a significant phenotypic variability, and even variability in severity among family members. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, you know, it's always the case in childhood absence epilepsy. I've seen literature sites anywhere from 20 to 30 or 35 percent of kids may develop a tonic-clonic seizure at some point in the future with childhood absence epilepsy. So it's always a concern. Uh, it, but it doesn't mean that ethosuximide still might not be a good drug then. And then should tonic-clonic seizures develop, you could always then at that point consider changing, although you could argue with me, why wait for the tonic-clonic seizure to develop? And I would say, why wait is because of the cognitive problems being higher with alpha weight, weight gain, and other factors as well. Uh, the, the third thing that is not talked about, because it hasn't been studied well, is that ethosuximide actually has some efficacy against tonic-clonic seizures. It's not fabulous, but it does prevent them in some people. 
and, and, and I personally learned this and you know, you learn medicine by, by seeing people and, and learning from experience. I had a, a guy I was treating for a long time uh, with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy who was just horribly intractable no matter what, he was having tonic-clonic seizures and the absences were quite minimal in his case, but myoclonus and the tonic-clonics were incredibly difficult to control. And actually in him, it was finally when I added methsuximide, because he couldn't tolerate ethosuximide, the addition of methsuximide made his tonic-clonic seizure stop to valproate. And I've been treating him now for over 30 years. Uh, so adding methsuximide to that. Uh, his sister then was brought to see me, uh, and she had a history of only myoclonus and some absence seizures, had never had a tonic-clonic seizure, and she had been on ethosuximide for 10 or 12 years when, when her parents brought her to see me. Her father was a physician also, a, a, a GP though. And I said, you know, you haven't had a seizure now in eight years or nine years, she, uh, since, she, since she was, a, since 18 or 19, she was in her mid twenties. And uh, you only had myoclonus and some absences and the absences are really the significant thing. And the myoclonus, you know, she could count on one hand the total number, number of myoclonus she had awake. Let's try stopping the ethosuximide. You're 25, you're a woman, maybe you'll, you know, you'll want to have, have children at some point before too long. Uh, let's stop that. We tapered her off of the ethosuximide and she promptly had a tonic-clonic seizure. Put her back on ethosuximide and she never had another one after that. So wow. you know, I've personally seen one person with ethosuximide early and then since then I've had quite a few patients, I would guess, at least 10 or 12 over my career who seem to be responsive, unresponsive to other things and adding ethosuximide or methsuximide did seem to stop tonic-clonic seizures or help them reduce the number somewhat. That's really a game changer. Thank you for your experience. But yeah. I have two more questions. One, when you stop isoxamide, what is the most fearful side effect that you think about? And second one is, what about resistant absence? If the patient didn't respond for valproate as well as uh, uh, isoxamide. What yeah. will you do? Okay, so good question. So uh, the first one is uh, the, the side effect to be most concerned about with isoxamide. And I think it's, it's, it's really cognitive problems and behavioral problems are the ones that I'm most concerned about. You can see GI side effects too, not rarely with that. Uh, but I, I, it's really the cognitive and behavioral ones you want to watch out for. And, and, and that's, it's a rule in adults, it's a, especially a rule in kids. And, and one of the things to tell the parents is to watch their school performance and you know, be in touch with a teacher depending upon their age. Uh, but probably not even depending upon their age, be in touch with a teacher. If they notice a change in behavior in the class, if you notice a change in grades and quality of homework, it's probably the drug you started. So that's what you want to watch for. You know, if they're resistant to ethosuximide, Valproate is the other best drug, so one or the other to go with, and sometimes then the combination of the two is quite, works quite well. There's one paper published, I believe, by A.J. Rowan in, back in the 80s, it's an old paper, uh, of the combination being effective for uh, absence when either one individually didn't work. And then a variety of other drugs have been tried. Some people try Lamotrigine, they've tried Levoteracetam, uh, uh, topiramate's been tried on this, although it's interesting, there was actually a randomized controlled trial for topiramate in which it was not effective for absence in the randomized controlled trial. Uh, uh, so people try whatever's out there. And other, other drugs that can sometimes help, an old one that does work on occasion is acetazolamide. Uh, uh, zonisamide also can have some work. Zonisamide is a T-channel. Uh, the T-type calcium channel blocker, and that may have some efficacy as well. Although again, you know, there's just not the level of data that we would like. So I think you know my go-tos after ethosuximide and valproate would be my next go-to would probably be the zanisamide or or acetazolamide actually, which is kind of old-fashioned, uh, but it, it does work and it's pretty benign. And then like everyone else, you try levetiracetam try lacosamide, you might try lamotrigine, uh, any of them can work. I have, I have one patient who, has, who had resistant absences that failed to respond to ethosuximide, failed to respond to alcohol. I put her on lamotrigine and she became seizure free. Uh, and so there's probably more than one type of absence seizure too. Let's move forward. Here's a picture. I want you to look at this video of the seizure. I'll jump forward a little bit. This fellow's in television, in bed watching TV. And I want you to tell me 
what do you think this, what kind of seizure this is and what localization? He has no aura. He has awareness and bilateral jerking by history. The nurse just asked him if he wants to take a walk. He's putting the bed up. There comes Lynn to take him for a walk. She asked him if he wanted his sneakers. He didn't answer. Right. Oh, boy. Okay, I'm going to give you a cut of word. I'm not sure you remember blueberry. Can you tell me where we are? Yeah, please. I came to find it. We were going to take a walk. Yeah, I was just unhooking them. Watch the jerking pattern, particularly towards the end here. Okay, so that was it. Let me go back for a moment and just watch the start of this again. He's putting the bed up. Lynn asked him if he wants his sneakers, and now he doesn't answer. He just sits up. We see him rotating to the left. Okay, I'm going to give you a code word. I want you to remember blueberry. Jerks are bilateral. It's got bilateral tonic. Posturing, arms and legs. And when he starts to jerk, he's jerking both sides. Yeah, please. Without any symmetry. I came to find it. We were going to take a walk. So let's ask before I put up my localization. First question, is this a vocal seizure? with secondary generalization or focal to bilateral tonic-clonic, or is this a primary generalized seizure? What do you think? And I, I don't have a poll. I want people to speak. Uh, it seems like a focal seizure with secondary generalization. Okay, so a focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizure, and why do you say that? Um, because of the impaired awareness at the beginning, and uh, after that there's a lateralization a sign uh, of his uh, head uh, uh, tilting to the left, and uh, this is a focal uh, sign. Okay, so what percentage of people with generalized tonic clonic seizures from onset, so idiopathic generalized epilepsy, who have been monitored, have lateralizing findings in the ictal behavior? Anybody know? About 20 or 30 percent. Yeah, the Cleveland Clinic group, who really focus heavily on behavior analysis, have published at least 35% of patients, some said, or even 40% of patients, have clear lateralized findings with lateralized head turns uh, when they have primary generalized epilepsy and primarily generalized seizures. Uh, his pause at the beginning could be focal impaired awareness, or, frankly, he could have an absence leading to a tonic-clonic seizure. So he could be having spike wave bursts going into a tonic clonic seizure for this. So I agree, you sh look at this and you sure think this has got to be a focal seizure, but recognize if you only have the behavior and don't have an EEG, you will be wrong on occasion. Now playing the odds, most people have focal epilepsy, so you're generally going to be right. You'll be right more often than your left if you're, if you're, if you're gambling money on each one of these, you'll make money in the end guess, guessing focal without, you don't even need a history. Uh, uh, in there uh, to, to, to guess focal because most people have focal epilepsy. So it does look focal. And then at the very end, uh, it's, it's not, not so easy to see, but if you look at his face, his face is jerking asymmetrically. And that asymmetric jerking in the face also raises in my mind a question that probably really is focal, even though his arms and legs were quite symmetric. So if we think he's focal, which I do too, Let's go to my next question. Where do you think the localization is? And I have right frontal, right temporal, left frontal, or left temporal. Uh, 
Okay. Too many of you are not offering opinions. Okay, we'll do three, two, one, poll closed. Okay. So five people said right temp frontal, seven said right temporal, two said left frontal, and two said left temporal. So I think we could say comfortably that with his head rotating to the left and body rotating to the left at the start, the probability is better than 90%. It's not 100%, but it's better than 90% that this is gonna be a right hemisphere focus. So playing the odds, we would wanna cross out left side. Now, could this be temporal or frontal? I think it could be either, you can't be sure. In fact, this person had a right dorsolateral frontal uh, focus. And you know, one clue that maybe it's a little more likely to be frontal than temporal if he were on full medication, but he's in the hospital, so he's not, would be the, the fact that he maybe was unresponsive for just a few seconds and then instantly turned hard to the left and rotated left and convulsed. Uh, you'd think with a temporal, primary temporal lobe seizure, particularly if it were mesial temporal spreading out, they'd be more likely to have a more prolonged period of unawareness and, and uh, uh, altered responsiveness before secondarily generalizing. But again, if it were temporal neocortical, he could go out quickly to that as well. So I think right hemisphere, and you can't be sure from looking at his behavior, which it would be. He happens to be frontal, but he could have been a temporal neocortical focus as well. Okay, another case. This is the full case. That was just a video. 24-year-old right-handed woman with seizure onset age 16. Her second seizure is at age 17, and then she's had refractory seizures since then. So she lived the first two-thirds of her life when I first met her, and I met her in 2006. Uh, uh, first seizure at age 16, second at 17, and then suddenly bad seizures. She has twitching of the right index fingers, usually, almost always, uh, and then her head will jerk to the right side. And then she'll jerk both sides. And sometimes you get this pelvic jerking or thrusting too for about 30 or 40 seconds. And she will fall with her seizures and she has hurt herself with her seizures. Sometimes when she gets the finger twitching at the start, her head versively turns to the right at the beginning. And sometimes the head doesn't turn. And she has 40 to 80 seizures per month. Her mother keeps a very careful count. Uh, her father was a physician, uh, but her mother's father owned a rum factory and when, her, and when his father-in-law retired, he stopped practicing medicine and took over the rum factory. Uh, so I like it when they visit me, as I get a bottle of rum every now and then. She failed every medicine on the market to 1986 when I saw her. They had tried the Atkins diet. They, they couldn't get her to do a full ketogenic diet, but the Atkins she could handle. And she had had a vagus nerve stimulator. It didn't work it either. And when I saw her, she was taking zonisamide, lamotrigine, clonazepam, and the VNS was running as well. She had been born floppy with delayed milestones, walking at 19 months, first talking at a year and a half, but slowly acquiring language. Her math could only get up to a second grade level and reading they thought was about a sixth grade level. Uh, she was adopted, so there's no known family history. And she had polycystic ovarian syndrome with hirsutism and obesity, and also thalassemia and some depression. Uh, on examination, she has a poor fund of knowledge. Her memory is not good. She's a little still floppy, decreased tone bilaterally. When holding her hands out, she has a little athetosis of the fingers and she postured both hands in, a, in, a, in sort of a semi-cortical way when, when held out. You can see neuropsych testing shows her IQ in the mid fifties and all the other tests of memory, et cetera. She's you know, at below the first percentile. She has just got global impairment everywhere. And then her interactual EEG background was slow with you know, five hertz activity, maybe predominating, so she was sort of a theta background. Uh, she has bifrontal sharp waves that are generally quite symmetric and not lateralized. Again, this girl who has right finger twitching at the start and, or right head version with twitching. And then the ictal onset of seizures is with bilateral, so a bifrontal delta wave and then bilateral beta, if anything, greater amplitude in the right frontal than the left. So let me open the discussion and let me ask several of you, please unmute and participate. Ideally, some people who haven't participated yet. What do you, th what, what do you think her diagnosis is? So let, let's, let's do the straightforward epilepsy diagnosis and what do you think the causes might be? Somebody. Okay, we have... Uh, uh, 
as regards the the development, we have both uh, delay in her motor and psychological functions. Uh, as regards her epilepsy, it looks like frontal loop epilepsy because of the very short-lived and uh, high-frequency seizure types. Uh, beside uh, the lateralizing uh, head turning sign as well. Uh, what is so, then, so, so if you wanted to classify the epilepsy, how would you classify our epilepsy? Focal or generalized, symptomatic or cryptogenic or, or idiopathic? Yeah, uh, I thought it is focal to bilateral uh, uh, with, uh, with frontal loop onset, but uh, it looks like Lennox Gastaut syndrome, but it is juvenile age of onset. That's why I, and her okay. age is not uh, suggested. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she doesn't really have mixed seizure types. She has one type of seizure. I mean, sometimes there's a head turn, but it always starts with focal finger twitching on the right. She does have cognitive impairment. She doesn't really have the EEG of Lennox Gastaut either. Uh, yeah, so she looks like a focal epilepsy. Could this be an inherited form, or do you think this is symptomatic? I think it is inherited form. So, what kind of inherited yeah. form? We, when we always have uh, a developmental delay without no obvious perinatal injury uh, with refractory epilepsy. I would think about uh, uh, genetic origin, whatever uh, the age of onset of epilepsy is. It could be, uh, we have seen that paper about uh, uh, genetic uh, origin of focal epilepsy in adults. And most yeah. of them have an age of onset very early in their childhood. Yeah, now her onset's at age 16. So you could wonder, does she have a genetic defect uh, one of the uh, one of the many sodium channel abnormalities, and, and there are a variety of other genes that could play a role. So that's a possibility. And what do you think yeah. her MRI is likely to show? Well, uh, the polycystic ovary syndrome is one kind of uh, of epilepsy syndrome, but I, I I don't remember who, the connection between it and the other epilepsy syndrome. Yeah. But uh, I know there is something uh, linking. It was epilepsy syndrome, but I yeah. yeah. So I mean, playing the, playing the odds, her MRI is going to be normal, or maybe she'll have a little bit of atrophy, but not, nothing more than that. But again, playing the odds, although she's a little floppy, so you'd wonder could she have leukomalacia. But let me show you her MRI. I put a couple of hours there, arrows there to be helpful. Wow. So this is her MRI, and I'll give you a poll to answer. What do you think the MRI shows? I'll move the poll over to the side a little bit so it doesn't block the MRI. We have polymicrogyria, cortical dysplasia, double cortex, hydrocephalus, or bilateral mesial temporal sclerosis. So, so far, pretty much everybody's gotten it right. We'll do a couple more a few more seconds to offer an opinion. And a number of people are not offering their opinions, which is fine. So what we have is that nearly everybody said double cortex syndrome. One person had said hydrocephalus, which is present. There's no doubt there's hydrocephalus. But this is one of these beautiful examples by MRI of double cortex syndrome. So in addition to the cortical rim that you normally see going around the outside, and there's atrophy as well, as you can see. You've got a second row of cortex down here. Right, so you've got nice double cortex syndrome. And uh, on the axial view, you see it as well. So this, this, this is a perfect example. And it's interesting that her seizures did not start until she is, was 16 years of age. And, and then yeah. she had a seizure, and then a little while later, a second, and then suddenly, you know, it exploded and, and hasn't gotten better. So it's a very interesting thing. So she's had every drug treatment known to humankind. Uh, she's tried an Atkins diet. She had vagus nerve stimulation. She now came to see me. She actually flew up from Florida to see me, uh, to Philadelphia where I am. Wh how, how am I gonna treat her? What should I advise? What do you think? I think surgery should be. What kind of surgery? I would go for either sub resections or callosotomy. Well, sub-peel rese sub resections? Yeah. Where? 
Oh yeah, <laughs> the lovely Portics. <laughs> that's that's terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you, arguably, all of her seizures start with right finger twitching. Maybe she has a left frontal focus, but arguably, if you were to do some sort of resection or sub uh, or or transection, you know, you would still leave ninety nine point nine five percent of her pathologic cortex behind, right? It's yeah, not likely to work. So you said callosotomy. Yeah. Does anybody it, else have an opinion? Does she have any motor weakness? No. Would you consider VNS? What's that? Uh, a vagal nerve stimulator. Would you consider? Well, she already has a vagal nerve stimulator in. She has lateralization in in her right uh, frontal loop more than left. Well, in her left, I mean, her, her seizures start with right, right finger twitching. Right finger twitches, yeah. Uh, Even though the EEG built up more right than left. So let me tell yeah. you, I mean, you could argue you could potentially put a thalamic stimulator in her. Uh, there's not a, that would, so DBS would be an option. Given this extensive pathology, SEEG would be, what's a good word for it, crazy? Uh, or any intracranial implant, I think, would be really be inappropriate in this circumstance. The likelihood of finding a well-defined focus is low, and then RNS is not going to be a possibility. Again, in 2006, DBS we could have done off-label, but uh, just putting in a stimulator uh, for Parkinson's disease there. Um, uh, but we don't know. What did we do? We did an anterior corpus callosotomy, reasoning that. She was seizing horribly. She's falling and hurting herself. And we would give it a try. There was zero literature on callosotomy in people with double cortex syndrome at the time. Since then, well, I've never published this. Since then, there's been one paper where somebody published doing a callosotomy and somebody like this would benefit. She was seizure free for about six months or five months, I guess, uh, when suddenly she had 60 seizures in over several hours. She went into status. Uh, and then she was fine. And she was fine for another nine months. And then she had one seizure in December 2007, as you can see, one in August 2008 after missing medicine. She had 10 over multiple days in May 2009. So she went you know, nearly a year after abruptly stopping drug, one a year after that in July 2010. And I last saw her in 2018, hadn't had any seizures in the preceding eight years. So this is somebody who went from 40 to 80 seizures per month to you know, one horrible day when she had 60 seizures in a day in a few hours, and then a remarkable improvement. So callosotomy is worth thinking about. I, I can't say too much about how it works or why it works. We don't understand that presumably there are fibers crossing between the two hemispheres that facilitate excitation or prevent inhibition. Uh, there's an epileptic network that is undoubtedly disrupted as a result of that. Uh, it also interferes with spread of seizures once they start. So there, there's clear benefit to that. It, it can have adverse effects as well, but in my experience, an anterior callosotomy done well tends to be very nicely tolerated in the long term. You don't detect much in the way of change in people if there, if there have been no complications from surgery. Uh, and this is an example of somebody who had sort of extensive bilateral disease. And, and the main reason I showed you this case was just again to show you this Pretty picture. It's an excuse to show it, really. Uh, but also, that don't forget about callosotomy. There's a tendency now to stick wires in people's heads and stimulate things, but the, the chances of substantial benefit are going to be a lot lower than doing a more definitive procedure, which uh, in this case would be a callosotomy. Uh, and you would not anticipate cure, and they were told in advance you will not be cured. Any questions or comments here? Uh, yes, please. Did she stop having the finger twitches as well? Well, the finger twitches were always the start of her full-blown seizures. So, I mean, the same, there was no isolated finger twitching that occurred as well. I mean, it was just, everything stopped. It was remarkable. Wow. Okay. It's Thank an you. Example of, it's an example of, of, of the epileptic network. Okay. Quick quiz. What do you think this MRI, and it's the MRI on the left, axial T2 view, and then on the right is a PET scan where blue is less FDG uptake and sort of whatever that pinkish, reddish, purplish is increased FDG uptake. So if you see, I'll point out there's an abnormality here. That area is hypometabolic. It takes, it takes up less, uh, 
less FDG. So what is your diagnosis in this case? And here's the poll. Your choices are anaplastic astrocytoma, tuberous sclerosis, cortical dysplasia type 2B, cortical dysplasia type 1, and Sturge-Weber. And there's only one right answer. This is a pathognomonic MRI. So anybody else want to vote? A lot of people haven't. I'll stop taking votes in three, two, one, over. And polling, I'll share the results. So the results, we have three people said anaplastic astrocytoma, three said tuberous sclerosis, eight said cortical dysplasia, and two people said Serge Weber. Okay, so you can see the results here. Anaplastic science. So half said cortical dysplasia type 2. So this is classic cortical dysplasia type 2B. You could wonder about, so cortical dysplasia type 1 doesn't show up in the MRI hardly ever. So that it's, it's hardly ever one. You could wonder about tuberous sclerosis because that can show lesions. This however, she has one feature that really argue, says strongly it's dysplasia type 2B. And you see this tail, so you've got the brightness here, and then this tail going down towards the ventricle from both of them. So this tail is a classic dysplasia, a type 2B dysplasia thing, this, this tail going down. So again, if you think about how the brain forms, you have a sack of fluid surrounded by that germinal matrix, and then the cells migrate out. And this is a tail of cells that incompletely migrated there. With tuberous sclerosis, you would typically not see this tail. You might see some haziness below it, but a tail that tapers like this, not. Anaplastic astrocytoma, it's too isolated. It doesn't involve, you know, it, it, it spares this gray nicely, and it's also very hypometabolic. You would expect an anaplastic astrocytoma to be normal or hypermetabolic. Uh, tuberous sclerosis, uh, as I said, can show some lesions, but not with a tail. What were the other choices I had? I had uh, Serge Weber. Yeah, Serge Weber, you would see unilateral atrophy and vascular abnormalities, which this person doesn't have. So that's, that's that case. And this is images courtesy of John Stern. John and I did a neuroimaging course together at, at the AES for a couple of years. And this is one of the pictures that we both through contributed pictures to it. This was a picture of his. Okay, one more case quickly, and then we'll wrap up. A uh, 19-year-old man with symptoms starting at age 13. He has occasional myoclonus of the arms in the morning. I have a theme this morning, uh, or this afternoon, I should say, or evening for those of you overseas. Uh, so myoclonus at age 13, uh, normal history and exam, his MRI and EEG were normal. Then at age 14, he had a tonic-clonic seizure 20 minutes after waking up. He was taken to see, you know, to the emergency room by the family. He was referred to a child neurologist who took the history, said you had one seizure, uh, Let's get tight, I'm not treating you. So my first question to you all uh, is, do you agree with that, not giving him a seizure, forgetting what it says below that he had more? Would you agree with not offering him treatment after his first seizure? I, I wish I had a poll to take a survey. He should be given, yeah. He should be given treatment because myoclonus is kind of seizure that recurrence rate is high. And uh, once we do have a single seizure and we have a possibility of recurrence, we should start uh, treatment. Okay, okay, good. So thank you, everyone. Yeah. Somebody else have an opinion? Yes? I mean, most likely JME, so you should probably treat. Yeah. Anybody else? Nobody else. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I would say you would probably treat. He has a history of waking myoclonus, and then he had a tonic-clonic seizure. So the probability of him having more is pretty high, and it's re quite reasonable to treat. Arguably... If you're putting them on medicine, though, you're going to be putting them on medicine for a long time, right? I mean, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy doesn't exactly go away by and large. So you're committing him to many, many years. And, you know, I, I could see where his doctor would say, you know, some people maybe have predominantly myoclonus and maybe he won't have any more tonic-clonic seizures or maybe his natural tonic-clonic seizure frequency is one every 10 or 15 or 20 years. He won't have very many. 
Uh, and so maybe I should wait to see if he has more of them before committing to medication for many years. So I think you could reasonably look at it either way, uh, high probability. And again, he was 14 when this happened. It's not like he's any of our ages where you know we perhaps have to drive to get to and from work. It could affect our livelihood or our ability to work uh, and everything else. This is a 14 year old kid who's gonna be in middle school at the time or maybe high school. And, uh, you know, arguably, provided he doesn't die from his next seizure or hurt himself badly, uh, you know, which, and the chances of that are rather small, but not zero, uh, you could perhaps wait to see, is he going to have another seizure? And what's the gap from seizure one to seizure two before treating? And that would, when you commit him to therapy for probably decades, you have a strong basis for doing so. Otherwise, he then comes to see you at age 30 and you see him and say, you had one seizure when you were 14. Yes, you had myoclonus, you had JMA, but you haven't had any more. Why are you on medicine all this year? What was wrong with that doctor who started him? I, mean, I can see it both ways. Uh, so like in much of life, there's probably more than one right answer. And I think the, the sensible thing is to discuss it with the patient and see where they stand. Uh, at age 14 and a half, so a few months later, he had a second tonic-clonic seizure also in the morning, a little bit after waking up. And then medication was prescribed and he was given levetiracetam, a thousand milligrams. And then his EEG shows generalized four hertz, actually four to five hertz spike wave. And our diagnosis, which we all agree, is juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. He's got myoclonus and he's got tonic-clonic seizures. He doesn't have absences. We're not going to diagnose JAE. Seven months after he's put on levetiracetam, at a thousand a day, he has another tonic-clonic seizure and he's still having occasional myoclonus. So the dose of levetiracetam is doubled to 2,000 milligrams a day. He then has another seizure at age 16, about a year later. The doctor raises his dose of levetiracetam, but he can't tolerate it. So then instead, he's left on the levetiracetam, and lamotrigine, 300 milligrams a day, is added. And this is, he's not a big kid. He's probably 120 pounds, little guy, uh, in weight and in height. Uh, so he's on now lamotrigine, 300, and levetiracetam, 2,000 a day. And then the following year at age 17, he has two more seizures over the course of a few months. And then lamotrigine is tapered away after having first been raised. And then he's put on up to 500, but he had it. And then he's put on Topiramid 200 per day, along with the levetiracetam, 2000 milligrams a day. And every tonic-clonic seizure is within half an hour of waking. And the myoclonus is generally in the morning also, though he occasionally has a myoclonic chair at the different times. Five months later, so he's at 17, put now on Topiramate and Levitiracetam. He's put on, he has another seizure, tonic-clonic, in the morning again. He's, Topiramate dose is raised to 300 a day along with the Levitiracetam. He's tired, his memory is not so good, he's irritable. And as I said, all the seizures in the morning, usually, but not always, preceded by myoclonus for 15 to 20 minutes. So they know in the morning if he's going to have a tonic-clonic seizure. Because, you know, most mornings when he has myoclonus, which is, might be a few times a month, he gets a jerk or two. Some mornings, he'll have jerks and jerks and jerks for 15 or 20 minutes. And when that happens, he always goes into a tonic-clonic seizure. Now, I can say that at least one of his tonic-clonic seizures was only preceded by a couple of jerks, and he had the seizure right away. So it's not like he has a reliable 15 to 20 minutes. So now, my question for you is this fellow, on Topiramate and Levitiracetam, who already failed, Motrogene, who is having some side effects. How are you going to treat him? And your choices: add valproate to the levetiracetam and topiramate. The other is add valproate, but get him off of the two. So he's on valproate monotherapy. Vagus nerve stimulation. He's failed three drugs. Give up on drugs, vagus nerve, or add clobazam. So let us launch a new poll polling question. And those are your choices adding valproate, substituting valproate and tapering away the other two, VNS or adding clobazam. So we're getting a mixture of answers. But there's one more popular than the other. So we'll do two more seconds, okay? Two, one, end the poll. And I will share the results. So, a majority of people, 12 of you said taper them off the other two and substitute valproate. One said add valproate. Two people said he's failed three drugs, give him a VNS. And one said add clobazam. Okay. 
and I would say independent also of those, since he has myoclonus for 15 or 20 minutes before most of the seizures, you'd want to give him rescue therapy, either an oral benzodiazepine, you know, oral clonazepam or oral lorazepam or an intranasal benzodiazepine, diazepam or midazolam to take uh, right when these clusters of jerk start, because maybe you'll block the tonic-clonic seizure. So that's another interesting approach that one could take. So what did we do with him? So what happened, Valproate 500 twice a day was substituted for topiramate, and he remains on levetiracetam 2,000 milligrams daily. So he's on dual therapy. He's not quite as groggy and, and, and irritable, and his Valproate level was pretty good, 68 micrograms per milliliter. However, four months later, he has a recurrent seizure, and he only had myoclonus for a few seconds before the seizure, so no adequate warning for rescue. Okay. So it didn't exactly work. This was his interrectal EEG, and you can see he's got these very nice generalized spike and polyspike and wave bursts, classic for juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, the polyphasic spikes. Okay. And then, in fact, an ictal EEG capturing and recording a seizure in this, in this guy, you can see leading in, you start seeing more frequent and prolonged bursts of generalized spike wave, and then it transitions to this fast activity at 10 hertz bifrontal 10 hertz, and then it goes to generalized tonic activity. So now what therapy are we going to advise? One more question and we're just about done. This is the last question. So what are you going to advise? Taper the, taper the levotracetam and just use valproate monotherapy, even though he just had another seizure. Add parampanil, add clobazam, add ethosuximide, or VNS. Few more people need to vote. Okay, and we're going to end it in three seconds. Two, one, vote. Finally, off. Okay, so this is what you said. Two people said taper levetiracetam and use valproate monotherapy. One said add parampanil. Six of you, nearly half, said add clobazam. One said add ethosuximide, which, as I said earlier, could work sometimes and three went for vagus nerve stimulator. So what did I actually do? This is when he came to see me. I tapered away his levetiracetam over a month and put him on valproate monotherapy. The other thing I said was, every seizure happens in the morning within half hour of waking, take all of your medicine at that time. There's no reason to take it twice a day. Okay, he stopped having seizures. The guy hasn't had a seizure now in nearly 10 years. So Valproate monotherapy saved the day. Had they continued, then you've got a number of options. And you know, I, you know, there's a good placebo-controlled trial showing that parampanil is effective in generalized epilepsy for tonic-clonic seizures. That's a good choice. I've given you my personal experience of ethosuximide and methsuximide. I don't know that they're as effective as parampanil. I would probably go with parampanil first myself. Zanisamide so is also thought to be reasonable with some data behind it. Uh, acetaz and it's cheaper than parampanil. Acetazolamide has very little data and others. You could try vagus nerve stimulation. I've not been terribly impressed. The odds of him becoming seizure-free with vagus nerve stimulation, I think, are incredibly small, as in the neighborhood of zero. You could offer an anterior callosotomy, but I would personally try four or five other medicines before thinking about that. And an anterior callosotomy for something that happens once a year is a tough sell. And the one thing I would absolutely not do is I would not do SEEG for resectable focus. I just, you know, I've been doing telehealth like the rest of you lately, and I just saw one of my patients uh, last week, actually, who I've taken care of for a number of years. In 2017, I went away on a sabbatical for a few months, and he saw a colleague in another institution in town, and he had clear juvenile monoclonic epilepsy like this person, and, and they wanted to do SEEG to look for a frontal focus with that kind of an EEG. And then I came back from sabbatical, it, it struck the family as a little uh, risky, and I said no, and I think in his case I added ethosuximide to uh, Valproate, and I just saw him, he's been now seizure-free for three years. And he was having tonic-clonic seizures every month or two uh, prior to that, uh, so it, it can work. So I think you have a number of drug options to use, but that would be you know, reasonable. In this case, I would say don't give up on anybody. First try Valproate monotherapy. When I first moved to Philadelphia long ago, I was a big hero 
because I had a lot of people who had Valproate added to something else, and all I did was take away the other drug, and more than half of them became seizure-free. A reminder in juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, this is a paper published from the group in Berlin uh, uh, at uh, Princess Elizabeth Hospital and, and Charité Hospital from uh, Dieter Janssen's original patients that he first saw. He was the man who described juvenile myoclonic epilepsy that unfortunately, if you go down here in the middle, terminal remission of tonic-clonic seizures in these patients, and he had a lot of them, 66, 53, and this is epilepsy with generalized tonic-clonic seizures, juvenile absence, and about two-thirds earned five-year remission, overall remission even a little bit less. So that unfortunately, this is not a condition that works wonderfully. And how many were terminally AED-free for five years? Only 15% of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, 9% of juvenile absence, and 16% of those. So it's unfortunately a condition that is commonly not completely controlled. Ideally, you get them down to no seizures, or if not that, a seizure every few years, or, or even less often than that. But uh, we need better treatments for it as well. So I think what I'm going to do is end at this point, and thank everybody. I apologize, I actually ran over a little bit. I wasn't looking at my watch. I apologize for running over, but I hope this was helpful. And uh, wish you all good luck, and thank you for joining me. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Thank you.